Okay, so uh, today I'd like to talk about some work I've been doing with uh, Daniel Romero on egalitarian uh, communities and the networks that support them. Uh, in particular, I'll be talking about a new network architecture we're analyzing and we call the nested tweak and some of its beneficial properties. And I'll be talking about an improvement on traditional web of trust models uh, that can be used to apply um, fault tolerance techniques to creating more resilient networks. So there's a lot of excitement about decentralized technologies right now with things like Bitcoin and the blockchain peer-to-peer. -peer. And the, the really exciting thing is not the technology itself, but the communities that the technology enables. And similarly, uh, decentralized decentralization may not be so interesting, at least to people outside this room. Um, what's really interesting is that decentralization can enable uh, egalitarian communities. And uh, I'll be looking at this topic specifically with a network science lens. This is just one way to look at it, uh, but one that I think is potentially very fruitful. So let's start by looking at some human, uh, human communities. You can start with the rugged, self-reliant individual, which is definitely not scalable and not particularly egalitarian. Now, when you think about people starting to come together, into egalitarian communities, you probably think about consensus, town halls, round tables, things like that. So those are more egalitarian, but tend not to be scalable. As the groups get large, communication becomes burdensome, and things tend to break down. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the top-down command and control hierarchies, uh, corporate, uh, traditional corporate style, uh, military style. Uh, these can be more scalable, but they're definitely not egalitarian. You've got the, the CEO who has the, all the power and the people at the bottom of the hierarchy who have little to no power. So the big question uh, that I'm hoping to work on a piece of is how can we get the best of both worlds? How can we find a way to build communities that are both scalable and egalitarian? And like I said, I'm looking at this through a network science lens. So the properties of these communities I'm focusing on are the associated underlying networks. So in the town hall where everyone talks to everyone, everyone's equal, you have a complete graph. And in the top-down hierarchy, you have a uh, tree with a root, children, and children of children, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so how do we start to find networks that uh, achieve both of these things? Well, we need to understand what, what the properties are in these networks that are useful. So let's start with scalability. If you want a scalable network, uh, first you have to be sparse. Uh, you can't have too many links uh, on any node. Uh, people have a limited capacity for social interactions that they can maintain. So if the, uh, if the number of links on a node grows too quickly as the network grows, you'll hit you'll hit an upper limit and you won't be able to grow anymore. Similarly, the networks have to be low diameter. Uh, there's usually some type of cost associated with the, uh, with the interactions in a community, whether it's time or resources. And if you have nodes that are very far apart from each other, separated by many hops, uh, adding up all those resources from all those links can become prohibitive. And as I said before, uh, decentralized decentralization can help create egalitarian networks. Uh, the uh, the complete graph is is definitely decentralized. Uh, in particular, in this talk, I'll be looking at vertex transitive graphs only. Uh, so they're kind of the the most decentralized you can think of because every node in these graphs is structurally equivalent to every other node. So regardless of what centrality measure you're using, uh, it'll be the same for all of them. And there's one more thing I want to talk about, uh, which is decentralization is not enough. You also need high connectivity in order for a, a community to be egalitarian. Uh, let's talk about why. Imagine that your community has a small number of disruptive or failed nodes. <clears throat> uh, in order to be egalitarian, you don't want that small number of nodes to be able to disrupt and take over the entire network. Now, if you look at uh, a single node, 
you can think about this in terms of disconnecting uh, the network. So if you view a disruptive node as removing the node from the network, uh, you can say, how can we remove nodes and still have the network connected? And that's just the concept of connectivity. And to measure this, I'll be using a non-standard uh, measure of connectivity that'll come in handy later. And that stems from the observation that, uh, say you want to disconnect this first node, uh, if you are able to remove its nearest neighbors, it's very easy. You only need to remove a couple. But if you have to remove neighbors that are very far away, you have to remove far more in order to disconnect it. Uh, so as long as your network branches out, this is generally true. And the measure that I'm using is how fast that happens. So how many nodes do you have at exactly h hops away from a typical node? So that delta of h is my measure of connectivity. So let's apply these, uh, these properties to some real networks. Uh, two of the networks I'm going to talk about have been used in parallel and distributed uh, computing for a long time, uh, partly because they have some of these properties. One of them is the m-dimensional cube. Another is the butterfly. And the third network is the new network that we're proposing and analyzing, which is the nested clique. Uh, to get an idea of the construction, uh, you can start with a clique and then take each node and recursively replace it with a smaller iteration of the nested clique. The, there are a little more details, but that's the general, general idea. So what are the properties of these networks? Uh, if we look at sparsity, we have degree on the left and log of the number of vertices on the bottom. Uh, all of these are under uh, our log or lower. Uh, the cube that here is the worst. The cube is, the degree is logarithmic in the size of the network. Uh, the, the nested clique is pretty, it is much better. It's uh, log log the number of vertices of the network. And the butterfly is slightly better than that. It's constant degree. Now let's look at the diameter. Uh, all of these are roughly logarithm logarithmic in the size of the network. Uh, the cube is a little bit better than the butterfly, and the nested clique is a little bit better than the uh, than the cube. <clears throat> Things get really interesting when we get to connectivity. So. All of these are exponential in h, the number of hops. Uh, but in the case of the butterfly, the base of the exponent is a constant. Well, with the cube, the base of the exponent grows with the number of nodes, so as the network gets bigger. Uh, and that's really desirable, because we want uh, scalable networks, and we want these networks to be high, highly connected. So if your network gets more connected as it gets bigger, that's great. That's exactly what we want. So how about the nested clique? Uh, well, so far we only have a lower bound, uh, and that lower bound has a constant base, so comparable to the butterfly. Uh, but there's reason to believe that when we find the actual uh, connectivity, it should grow with the size of the network. Uh, so why is that? Well, if you think about the reason uh, that the butterfly doesn't, it's because of the connection between degree and connectivity. So the butterfly had a uh, constant degree. The degree doesn't grow as the butterfly network grows. So you don't really expect the connectivity uh, to grow. Whereas the cube and the nested clique uh, both increase in degree as the network gets bigger. So it would, be, it would be great if this was true because it would give us an alternative uh, that isn't limited uh, by sparsity the way the cube is or by connectivity the way the butterfly is. Okay, now let's change gears and talk about applying this to a real problem, uh, specifically secure communication between two parties. One of the common techniques that's been understood in information security for a long time is the web of trust. You start with yourself and your trusted friends, and you extend that trust uh, to their friends and then to their friends. And this is a great way to build up a big network very quickly, but it's, it's actually not a very good model uh, for a couple of reasons. So one, it's not very realistic. Uh, you, can't, uh, you can't assume infinite transitivity in the real world. A friend of a friend of a friend 
isn't usually trusted the same as your closest friend. Similarly, all links uh, are treated equal. So one trust link here is really equivalent to 100 trust links. It's just, is it in the network or is it not in the network? Uh, so a lot of network information that could be potentially useful is getting thrown out. So we use that information uh, by creating what we call a partial trust model. So we assume that up to h hops away, you can trust perfectly. And then beyond that, nodes are more or less trusted, but have, have uh, but some small number of them will fail or uh, be disrupted. What that h hops, uh, what those h hops do is they allow uh, trusted paths to several um, to several nodes that stand between your local component and the rest of the network. And we call those paths, uh, we call those nodes the trust boundary. And that creates an element of redundancy that you can take advantage of. So imagine uh, taking some number, uh, some fraction of those nodes in the trust boundary and sending copies of your message to all of them. Uh, or through all of them, I should say. That's the x-axis on this plot here. Now imagine that uh, also in the network, beyond that trust boundary, some number of nodes have failed. Uh, that's the y-axis here. And it's important to note that uh, in this plot, we're looking, at, uh, we're looking at adversarial failures. So these, this is the worst possible case. Uh, random failures are much easier to deal with. <clears throat> so now the question is, how uh, will an error get through undetected? So can a message be entirely blocked or entirely corrupted? Uh, and that happens uh, as long as, well, it gets through or an error is detected as long as one message can get through. Uh, so what we're looking at is the probability of a uh, error getting through undetected and uh, black is zero, white is 100%. And the important thing in this graph is that the center region is very black. So that means that a large change in the number of faulty paths can be corrected for by a very small change in the number of utilized paths. So it's very easy to defend and difficult to attack. <clears throat> And what's even more interesting is that this effect becomes more pronounced uh, when you increase delta, so as the connectivity of the network increases. Uh, so this model gives us a way to uh, use the structure of the network to improve our trust model. So to recap, uh, I've introduced the nested clique, which has uh, slightly better uh, diameter properties than the cube and the butterfly. It's vertex transitive. Uh, it doesn't have the sparsity limitations that the cube has. And although we haven't uh, proven it, uh, we suspect that the connectivity um, may be better than the butterfly. And uh, we've applied these concepts to a partial trust model, uh, which is more realistic than the web of trust and allows us to incorporate network structure and fault tolerance to create more resilient networks. So thank you.